This is the first of two weeks we are going to spend on Jane Austen's novel Persuasion. I'm going to talk this week about volume one, which is roughly half of the novel. And there are three main ideas to what I'm going to say this week. I'm going to talk a little bit about the literary form of the novel. Then I'm going to mention some of the major components that we expect to find in a novel. And finally, I'm going to suggest ways in which we could unite some of the observations we've made about the book to make overall interpretations of it. To start off with, I want to talk about this idea of volumes. You'll notice that the paperback of Persuasion is divided into volumes. It doesn't mean much to us as readers of a modern paperback, but to readers of Austen's time, it meant something physical, something tangible. Austen's original reader couldn't just go out and buy a complete version of Persuasion in one book like we have in the paperback. Instead, you would go into a bookshop and leave with something like this picture. We call these books in boards, which is how they were printed and sold. It was up to you as the owner to go off to a bookbinder who would apply proper covers to your books, turning them into beautiful objects like in this picture, which shows us two bound first editions of Austen. And it was considered a poor form not to have your books bound properly. It made you look like a sort of shabby person or it wasn't gentlemanly to put it in another term of the time. Book owners went to all sorts of different book binders, which is why you'll come across copies of books that are actually the same edition, but they look utterly dissimilar on the outside. On the other hand, if you see a personal library in an old stately home, or perhaps in a period drama in which all the books look nice and uniform, it's because they were all bound by the same person and it has nothing to do with the actual contents of the books. Novels were broken down into volumes like this simply for practical reasons. It was to do with the maximum number of pages you could stick together without the book being likely to fall apart. Most novels in the 18th and 19th centuries occurred in three volumes, a really long novel might be four volumes, and a short novel like Persuasion would only be two volumes. Most novels wouldn't be serialized, by which I mean the entire thing was published at the same time. You wouldn't just get volume two and wait for volume three. You'd have to take them all at once as a set. This structural condition of breaking novels into volumes did affect how they were written. As an author, you couldn't simply write a big long story and leave the printer to divide it up. You couldn't have volume one ending mid-paragraph or mid-sentence resuming in volume two. You had to write according to the structure. In a way that is equally true of a Hollywood blockbuster or a television series, you have to write to the structure. Later in the 19th century, Charles Dickens wrote in installments for magazines, which is why his books are full of cliffhangers to bring the readers back next time. Jane Austen's Persuasion is more like a Netflix miniseries. All the installments are available at the same time, but the story has to compel the reader to continue by picking up volume two, or else he or she won't want to buy any more Jane Austen books or books published by John Murray. If these conventions seem quaint and old fashioned to us now, they were fairly recent at the time of Austen's persuasion. The novel had only become an important literary form in the 18th century. In fact, the name of the form comes from the French nouvelle, meaning new. And secondly, this pressure to motivate the reader to stay with the book reflected changing expectations in the literary marketplace and changing values among readers of books. Traditionally, literature was didactic or instructive. It was supposed to teach you something. You would finish a book under the assumption that it was for your own good. Yes, authors had to make the message palatable, but they were less concerned with amusing the audience than they are now. European printing had been invented to reproduce the Bible, so the entire impulse of the publishing industry had been educative. However, when the novel came along, people read books primarily to be entertained, not to be taught lessons, and authors knew that they had to do something to keep readers hooked. Nowadays, the novel is quite a fluid form. There's great variation in length, and writers have a lot of freedom in where they distribute the twists and turns of the plot. 
And a lot of that is to do with the fact that with modern publishing possibilities, you can print a book of pretty much any length, but the novel in Austen's lifetime had structural conditions which might be compared to the five acts of a Shakespearean tragedy. Austen had to write according to this convention. For this reason, it's no accident that a vital turning point in persuasion occurs at the end of Volume 1. This is Louisa Musgrove's accident, which leaves her comatose. Her accident occurs at a time when Louisa and Frederick Wentworth appear to be reaching a romantic understanding, and at which Anne has met a kindred spirit in the desolate Captain Benwick. But to complicate matters, Anne's coolness in the aftermath of Louisa's accident and the admiration she receives from a stranger seems to revive Wentworth's old feelings for her. This is a lot of drama to come about all of a sudden in a rather slow-moving novel. The uncertainty, the suspense, coaxes the reader on to volume two. So to study a novel, we need to understand the structural conditions and their implications for narratology the study of why a text is the way it is, which is not always to do with an author's personal preferences.